Okay. So uh, the Bible and gender or the Bible and women, that's uh, principally what I'm going to be talking about. So yeah, I, I, have a, I have a PhD in New Testament, but also in Roman social history. So I was really interested in not just the theology, but the actual context uh, 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 of in which that, well, the New Testament was written and the New Testament actors were, were living their lives and living a life of faith. So I'm just always fascinated by that, by that interplay. Um, so, uh, I'm going to spend some time tonight just on introductory issues and then what I'm calling background issues. Not really sure what the difference is between those two, but, um, we'll try to, we'll try to explain that. And then the evidence. So this, this is going to be the all three weeks, this outline. So it's, uh, we're, um, yeah, we're not going to have a new outline next week. So the evidence, we're going to look at particular passages. That'll spend a lot of time. We'll look at some of the problematical ones or some of the ones that are really central. We'll look at, we're going to start by looking at Genesis 1 and, and creation. Um, and then uh, a couple other passages in Genesis that, that, that relate to that. We'll talk about what it means, what headship means. Uh, the husband is the head of the life as Christ is the head of the church. So, we'll talk, so we're going to talk about a lot of this. We'll talk about some very... Uh, problem, what are often problematical passages, maybe most significantly, First Timothy 2, I permit no woman to teach or bear authority. That sounds pretty clear. But elsewhere, Paul says, when the women pray and prophesy, which presumes they're praying and prophesying. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of it then is, we, well, we have to uh, remember that almost all of Paul's letters are written to particular situations. Somebody wrote him a letter and said, hey, we got these problems. Very few, Romans is written more like he's thinking like a theologian, but the others are all responses. So if, if my phone rang right now and I said, excuse me, and, I, and you heard me say, yes, hello, yeah? Yeah, yeah, oh, really? I, lo oh, I love you too, yeah. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll see you later. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. And you say, was that your wife? And I said, no, it's my mom. You got to kind of change what's going on, you know, what you're thinking is going on on the other side of that phone conversation. So most of Paul's letters are him responding to, a, to we, oh, it's only half a phone conversation. We don't know what people wrote him. So just a little bit by way of introduction. So first of all, you know, this is a contentious topic. People get really upset about this. And people can get pretty uh, loud and boisterous and argumentative about this uh, and very righteous about it. It can be emotionally charged. It can touch deeply old convictions related to biblical authority, gender, and justice. I think that's really true. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people have uh, feel very emotional about it because of stuff that's actually happened in their lives. I mean, made a little joke, but it's been her experience that people have told her, no, you can't be a pastor. Well, you know, what about her own giftedness? What about her, you know, what about the fact that God gave her certain gifts, et cetera? So, um, and what follows, I'm gonna to try to set out, and I'm gonna to try to do it as faithfully as I can, and you can, you can question, it'd be great to question, uh, uh, but I'm gonna set out as faithfully as I can the biblical evidence. And the biblical evidence can be confusing. You ought to just admit that. So Paul, for instance, in most English translations can say, let the women keep silent. That's 1 Corinthians 14. Let the women keep silent. But in the same letter, those same translations have Paul write, as I just said, when the women pray and prophesy. So what is it? Keep silent? They should keep silent? Or they can pray and prophesy? And of course, one of the problems is our Bibles are written in English and Paul wrote in Greek. And so tr words don't often, tran they, don't, you, they often do not translate uh, Word, uh, uh, the same content. They don't convey the same nuance, the same denotation and connotation. So denotation is the definition. Connotation are related ideas. And denotation and connotation together form meaning. So we can have, we can have two words, one in Greek and one in English, that have the same denotation, the same dictionary definition, but different connotations. And so we can't help but interpret the words we read by our own experience. But that experience might be alien and not even the exact opposite of what was originally intended by Paul or somebody else. So that's just an example that it can be 
complicated. So on the surface, it appears Paul both does and does not endorse women teaching, speaking, leading in the Christian community. So we're going to think, we're going to have to think hard about exegesis. So exegesis is just a fancy term for how we interpret something. And we usually think of it as the Bible. So what are the, what are the standards? What are the, what are the rules? Maybe rules is too strong. But how do you know you're faithfully interpreting what was originally written? How, how can you, how do you know you're doing that? You're actually paying attention and you have in your mind what Paul had in his mind instead of just whatever comes to your mind when you read the text. And I'm going to come to the conclusion that the biblical model is that while gendered or sex-specific differences exist in Christ, these, these differences are to be of no advantage or disadvantage. So I'm telling you up front, that's the position I'm going to come to. I've published on this issue. There are other people who publish on the issue and, and argue differently, but this is something I, um, I think I actually know something about. I don't always know a lot about what I talk about, but this I think is something that I know something about. So that's the position I, I'm gonna come to, but you're gonna tell you that right out, but I'll show you how we get there. You know, or maybe a better way to say, it seems to me that a position that supports women serving in ministry makes the most sense of the biblical evidence, makes the most sense. Um, I think there are certain passages uh, in this, uh, um, pretending to this question, that also point the other way. Um, but to me, the position I've just articulated is one that makes the most sense out of the most evidence. And the, taking the other position leaves all kinds of questions unanswered. So I'm not going to contend that folks who have come to a different conclusion are wrong because uh, it's not, the evidence is all the same mix. But I do think a fair reading of all the evidence is clearly points in the direction I've indicated. And I'm going to say overwhelmingly, like 78, 70, 30, 80, 20, not 55-45. But there are some knowledgeable scholars of goodwill uh, on both sides of the issue. So some background issues. Um, so the Bible's written in two languages, maybe you know that, Hebrew and Greek, although there are a few passages in what we call the Old Testament that are, that are um, written in Aramaic. So Aramaic was um, uh, a, a, a general Semitic language uh, that Abraham spoke, that Jesus spoke. It was, people spoke it in what we call Israel. They, they spoke it in what is today uh, uh, Iraq, they spoke it in, in today, what is today Syria, and even in what is today parts of Saudi Arabia, the, the northern parts. So, and translation is an important business, and it's, so it's connected to the question of meaning, and meaning is composed of these two elements, sense and referent. So sense is what I'm saying, referent is what I'm saying it about. So my little example of the phone call earlier, you know, the, you knew the sense of what I was saying, but what was I referring to? Was it my wife or my, you know, my, my mom? Real different meaning, depending on, on the referent involved. So also, um, the, the, the sentence, simple English sentence, I'm mad about my flat. So if you're an American, you're upset at your tire. But if you live in London, you're super happy about your apartment. Right, same English sentence, very simple. Six words, seven syllables, wildly different meaning. And there's also, as I said, the matter of denotation and connotation. So denotation is the dictionary definition. Connotation are related, are related ideas that we sometimes sweep into the bucket of meaning. So think about the question is, is the source of a river the same as the origin of a river? And uh, so I've been, uh, I used to, when I was younger, did a lot of backpacking, mountain climbing. I've been to places up in the Sierra. I've been to what is really the, the headwaters of the San Joaquin River. There's a little lake just south of, uh, of Yosemite, the border of the Yosemite. So that, that's, that's the source. But the origin is actually probably the snow field just on the other side. But they're really close. They're you know, not even a half mile apart from each other. So, so source and origin there are close. But if you think about a different example, is the source of a news story the same as the origin of a news story? There, they're pretty far apart. 
The origin is the event. The source is the person who tells the reporter about it. So if we, so just because, if we're not clear about connotation and denotation, that can muddy the water when we do interpretation. Is that making sense? Any questions about that? I hope that makes sense. So similarly, while, le while rulers are leaders, not all leaders are rulers. I think Luciano Pavarotti, when he was alive, everybody thought he was the leading tenor in the world. But he wasn't king over all the tenors. Whereas sometimes when people talk about leadership in the Bible, they then assume if you're a leader, you've got to be in charge. You've got to be like the general over, over the whole army. Well, that doesn't necessarily pertain. So and it's commonly associated, uh, if we commonly associate leader in our, with the word head in our culture, we, we shouldn't rightfully assume that the word head carries the same set of connotations in another culture. So understanding meaning, so, so, are, those, um, so are those appointed to leadership in the New Testament church ruling in the manner the Roman world understood the practice of authority? Because we talk about, some churches talk about ruling elders. Well, the Romans, <laughs> the Romans were not interested in the well-being of the people they conquered. You know, in fact, they were known. Even Jesus says, you know how the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. So in their culture, a ruler is someone who extracts as much as possible. The, the Roman idea wasn't, um, we want to beat you down and show you we're in charge. The Roman idea was, we want to extract as much money from you as we possibly can. And we want to push you right to the edge of revolt and then back off a step. Because if you revolt, that's going to cost a lot of money to put the revolt down. And so that's why they even used puppet rulers, like Herod was not even a Rome, but he was their, he was their pawn. So they, they had a certain notion of their rule, which, sought, which saw the people they ruled as uh, engines to, you know, for wealth. So their leadership was abusive, in a, even in an indirect way. So even when, when, when talk, people talk about leadership in the New Testament, sometimes people write about it and they're not, it's like they're not really aware of the word, what that word would have meant in that culture. So understanding meaning accurately requires knowledge of the grammar, the vocabulary, and the imagery of the original languages, and something about the historical, cultural, and social context of the authors. That means that as our knowledge deepens, our understanding of the text may change. So uh, maybe you've heard of the guy named Jerome, uh, lived in the 300s, uh, and he's the one who translated the Bible from Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into Latin. So if you've ever watched movies about the Middle Ages, you know, I mean, they're always talking Latin because the, the, the West, in the European West in the Middle Ages, they, they lost the ability to read Greek or understand Greek. So Jerome translated the original Hebrew and Greek of the Bible into Latin around 350 AD. And this version is called the Vulgate. That's where we get our word vulgar because it means the common tongue. So originally, vulgar just means common. It, does, it didn't have the negative connotation it has today. So in, in it, he translated the word metanoia, which is repent. He translated that as do penance. Facite ergo fructum dignum penitentiae. But he did that before there was a sacrament of penance. So it meant repent. But the idea then grew in the Middle Ages of this, of this sacrament that you have to do penance. Go to the priest, ask for forgiveness, and the priest will then tell you to go do something before you get forgiven. So millions of people, after that practice started, would read what he wrote which was Jesus saying, repent and believe the gospel. And what they came to think the Bible was saying is, go to the priest, ask for forgiveness, do penance, and believe the gospel. Is that making sense? So you can see how, 
how how the way the way we understand words, um, and how they and how the um, uh, the influences that are placed on them can really change the text. So we have to be uh, just a, a, at least a little bit aware of that dynamic. So as I said, Jerome wrote this before penance was widespread. A guy named Cyprian actually developed the sacrament of penance, um, but it took four or 500 years for it to become widespread. And for more than 1,000 years, that was how people read the Bible. But in the early 1500s, a guy named Erasmus recovered the, began recovering ancient Greek manuscripts. They'd been lost, nobody had thought about finding them. He started looking for ancient Greek manuscripts, and he reproduced the original Greek New Testament. Or he's the first guy to try doing that. And that was published in 1516. Guess who bought one in 1517? Martin Luther. <laughs> so that, it was Luther reading the reconstructed Greek text that was part of the, the spark that got, him, you know, that got him going. But that's when people learned the original Greek says, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, not bring forth fruit worthy of doing penance. All that to say, we need to have some idea of, of words, meanings, and the, and the cultural context. So sometimes careful and conservative use of linguistic and historical tools lets us see even more clearly what the biblical authors meant. So what's the nature of the evidence? First, we're going to look at particular passages. Then we're going to look at terms for leadership and their meaning. Third, we're going to talk about the gifts and function, uh, gift and function. So the spiritual gifts, uh, preaching, teaching, whatever, insight, whatever, and their function and how we understand authority. And then some broad Pauline principles. Now, a broad Pauline principle seems to be the old order that pertained as a result of the fall is being overturned. Right? It's this way, but in the Lord, it's not so. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. In their world, those things mattered a big deal. If you were a slave and you were set free, you would never be a free person in the Roman system. You would always be a freed, F-R-E-E-D, person. They kept track of that stuff. There's a throwaway line in the book of Acts that mentions the synagogue of the freed men. So there's a synagogue just for people who had once been slaves and are now free. That's in a Jewish synagogue. This is a culture that was crazy fascinated by making sure you stayed in your lane. Way more than anything that we experience as, as uh, unpleasant as a lot of contemporary culture can be. But this was highly institutionalized. But Paul says that old order is being overturned because of what Christ has done. And another broad principle is some things are more important than others. I'll do whatever it takes to win people to Christ, to the rich, rich, to the poor, poor. Paul will say, yeah, are people, yeah, are people going to, you know, I don't care that people are, ta are, are talking me down, they're talking bad about me as long as Christ is being preached. Other places he's pretty upset about people talking, talking down to him. So he has, a, he has a principle of priority. There are certain things that are more important than others. And then when those things are taken care of, then the second level becomes important. So I think a good, a good image, I think, for understanding Paul is he, he has a compass, not a map. Because a map only works if you happen to be where the map, you know, what the map uh, represents. But a compass can help you anywhere. And what, the last night we'll talk about the elements of, what I think are the elements of Paul's compass. So some select themes and relevant passages. Creation and humanity. So Genesis 127. So Elohim is one of the words for God in Hebrew. Yahweh is another, but Elohim is the word for God. This is the general word for God. Yahweh is God's name. So Elohim creates the human, Ha'adam. In the image of Elohim, he creates male, Zakar, and female, Unkba. Now in your Bible, it probably says he creates 
him. And that's because um, there is a, an untranslatable marker in Hebrew that says what comes next is the, um, is the object of the verb. But it's not a word, but it's there. It's, actually, it's, it's letters, but it's not translated. So translators hit that and they say, we have to, you, we have to put something in there. So the word him isn't in the text. The text simply says, in the image of Elohim, he creates, pay attention, male and female. That's all the text says. So male is Zakar, female, Unkba, he creates them. There's no mention of man and no mention of woman. Instead, only human, male, and female. Male, Zakar, female, Unkba are both part of what it means or included in what it means to be Ha'adam. So human being. Unkba is equally human being with Zakar. So as I said, that, 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 that uh, the word translated as him, is, it, it's represented as et, but it's an untranslatable in, uh, indicator, as I mentioned. So the word Adam is Hebrew for human, but the confusing part of the story is when there's a guy, his name is Adam. But Adam means human. And it appears that the text is saying that God created humankind and that both male and female are necessarily constituent parts. They're both equally human, Adam, and it wouldn't be Ha-Adam if one of them weren't there. Or perhaps we could say whatever is, whatever is fully Zakar and whatever is fully Unkba, both of these were parts of the original Ha-Adam. Genesis 7. Now, a straightforward reading of the Hebrew, and biblical Hebrew is r rather simple syntactically. But a straightforward reading, just going word for word, to be, and Yahweh Elohim is forming Ha'adam from the soil of the ground. He is blowing in the nostrils of Ha'adam, and Ha'adam is becoming a living being, a Haya Nefesh. So God forms from the ground Ha'adam, not male nor man, but ha'adam. So the verse appears to be about the creation of humanity, not the person called Adam. In part, this is the likely running, most likely, because the text hasn't even used the word man yet. Just male, female, and ha'adam. So God forms from the ground Ha'adam, not man or male, but Ha'adam. Now the rabbis in ancient times wondered about this. And one proposition that the rabbis came up with is that this Adam certainly is not a male of the species, but the text is speaking of humanity. And the rabbis recognize that both universally, that both male and female are both in the image of God. 220, for uladam, for human, no helper, etzer, suitable, genegdu, he finds. That is, God finds. So it's for adam that no suitable helper God finds. It's not for a, a guy named Adam. It's for adam no suitable helper is found. The word man hasn't yet appeared. So in the word for helper in our world implies inferiority, right? Anonymous, interchangeable, worker, drone, one, four, seven, six. <laughs> but the word helper occurs 20 times in the Hebrew Bible and two thirds of the time, God is the, is the person called the helper. So in the Bible, see, it's, there's, a little, there's a little bit about our cultural issues. We think of the helper as the anonymous assistant, interchangeable, don't even know who you are. But for them, the helper is the one who actually can help, is the superior person. So think about what that might do when we talk about the woman as a helper. <laughs> that changed it pretty, pretty dramatically, I think.
Now in 2.22, the text says that Yahweh takes from the side of Adam and makes, of Adam, and makes Isha, that's woman. And the word for man, which is Ish, doesn't even occur until 2.23. So it's not from Ish that God makes Isha, it's from Adam God makes Isha. And the man, in 2.23, the man, Adam, says the woman was taken out of man-ish. This is, uh, this 2.23 is the first mention of man as the male of the species. So how do we reconcile this with 2.22? Because 2.22 says the woman's taken out of Adam. Well, it might be because there's no Adam there anymore. <laughs> now there's just the gendered pair. Does that make sense? So I, I'm not trying to, that's, that's what the text says. So I'm just, I'm not trying to hide it. That's, that's just what the Hebrew says. Even though the verse right before it says it's out of Adam. But the point should be remembered that both woman and man are both equally part of Adam. Now in Genesis 3 is a story of original sin. Now, in some contemporary thinking, and this has become kind of popular in certain uh, evangelical uh, traditions in the last 30 years or so, to read this as the original sin is Eve uh, usurping the leadership role that belongs to Adam. I hear that a lot, but then I'm in probably a lot of strange conversations. So I don't know if, I don't, I don't know if you hear that a lot, but, um, but that, that's pretty typical. You know, the point is, though, the text doesn't say that. It's not, it's not in the text. The text doesn't say anything about Eve usurping the leadership role, nor is this an, an option that the ancient rabbis followed. I mean, they're the ones who are closer to, to understanding the text than we are. And some see Genesis 3.3 as the key. Here, Eve says, you must not touch the tree. But what God actually said is, you are not to eat from the tree. Eve adds the, or touch the tree. So some people see that as um, the sin of Eve isn't the original sin, but it's saying, well, we, we, we don't have to deal with what God is actually saying. We can deal with the, with the rule we've created around what God has actually said. So my point is, you might encounter folks who, who argue, and I encounter them a lot, that the original sin is Eve's sin, usurping the leadership role that, is, that Adam has because he's the man in the family. I ask anybody, show me where the text says that. I mean, it just doesn't say that. Is that am I making sense here? Is this, is this, are you, is this okay? Is this okay? Okay. I mean, it's not ice cream, but it's pretty, you know, it's okay. Well, translation is always, always, I mean, it's always interpretation. Every time you translate, I mean, word for word, and there's a question of not just let's say, denotation, but, but, connot but connotation and nuance and culture. Um, so, um, and so that's why we have many different translations. I mean, there's a, 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 a standard one for a long time, like when I was a kid, was the Revised Standard Version, the revision of the ancient King James, which I grew up going to Sunday school reading. And then the New International Version came out, pretty, rather trustworthy, updated the language a little bit. Um, and then, uh, then a lot of other translations came out, and some of them clearly with the, from a certain point of view. There are some translations that definitely it's almost that the reason for it was they want to defend a certain position on, on the role of women in church and in the family. And they frankly thought that the NIV was too, was too soft on that. Um, so tr translation is always a little bit of an, a, a risky business. So maybe the greatest, one of the greatest New Testament scholars of the last 200 years, a guy named C.H. Dodd, he died in, you know, 60 years ago. Um, 
but he was in charge of the, of the whole committee for the translation of the Bible for the, for the new Bible for the Book of England. And I've got some of his original notes because my doctor father was his, one of his students. So, um, and he's got, there's like five pages of his notes on the committee deciding how to translate um, the voice from heaven. You are my son in whom I'm well pleased. Four or five pages about that one phrase. So yeah, they're wrestling with it. So you, the answer is, yeah, it can be, it's a lot of hard work, but there are a lot of very important decisions they make. And so they're talking about on the, um, so you're my son in whom I'm well pleased. So some of the uh, some of the possibilities were on you my choice is fixed, you know they they wrestle with that one maybe that's not the right nuance, so yeah it can be hard because you want to translate you want to translate the words effectively but you also want to translate you also want to capture the new one the original nuance and not just the original um, flat dictionary definition, so so my point on this one the one we just talked about though is. Um, there's nowhere in the text that says the sin of Eve, or even implies it, the sin of Eve is usurping Adam's authority. The text just doesn't say it. So Genesis 5, this is the written account of Adam's line. When God, Elohim, created man, Adam, he made him in the likeness of God, Elohim. He created them male and female, Zakar, Ungpa, and he blessed them. And when they were created, he called them Adam. So that's, that's just unmistakable, right? Female, male are both equally part of what it means to be Adam. That, that's pretty important to get that, soak that into your, into your head and into your, into your heart. So creation isn't about, I'm going to say creation is not about the creation of women as an inferior photocopy of, of the man, the male of the species. There's something, about, there's something about us needing each other that mirrors God. After all, God is not just one person, right? God is a trinity, as hard as that is to get our brains around. But maybe the best way to think about it is, I'll get you, I'll, but maybe the best way to think about it is, um, what would it be like, you say there's God with one, three persons, one God, three persons, one nature, so what does Jesus say in John's gospel at one point? He says, I do only what I see the Father doing and everything the Father does that the Son does. Imagine what it would be like to be, have another person and you shared exactly the same purpose. Right? Exactly the same agenda, exactly the same purpose. Well, that, that's the formula for the Trinity that the, or, or that the early church worked out. Three persons, they call it one nature, but it's also you know, one unchanging purpose. And part of what marriage is supposed to be, right, is for these two who, are comp who complement each other to grow together in a common purpose. Does that make sense? So once again, the text, I do not think the text is saying men, women at, the, at creation, the women are somehow inferior to men. We actually need each other. Yes. Oh, uh, there was a question over here. First, yeah. When we get to that, that'll be next week probably. Okay. Sorry, I have a microphone. I should use it. When we get to that, <laughs> I've been to school. Yeah. So when we, um, I actually don't think so, but that's not bad to be thinking along those lines. But we'll get to that next week. There was another. Yes, sir. So, with, so there's like names actually signify something. Yeah, there's a naming convention. So there's a pattern of noun, and then they're called this. 
Uh, is there some intention behind that? Because in Genesis five, it's clear that her name and his name is Adam. But when uh, Adam changes that name to Eve, is what's the significance behind that? Yeah. So, so he's human and she's life. Well, you can't be alive unless you're, you can't be alive unless you're an organism, and you can be. You, if you're an organism without life, you're just a blob of protoplasm, right? So, so it isn't. I mean, it's true that later on Hebrew, it's much more elaborate, right? Because they name they name people things, and of course Hebrew is a is a written language without vowels, so they consciously play around with that. You know, Jesus. Who does is that. they? Pardon? Who is they? The they uh, that the biblical writers do, or okay. Jesus? Jesus does. So, you know, in, uh, at the beginning of John's gospel, right, um, he says, you know, you are an Israelite in whom there is no guile. So, ish, so ish Roy L is the man who sees God, <laughs> but ish Rael, so I mean, Jesus is playing with that uh in addressing uh, this disciple so they they do like to play around because they because the written language doesn't have vowels but that is, that isn't so much at work here i don't think okay so let's get to headship um genesis 1 uh, colossians 1 18 text read it reads and he is the head of the body of the church he is the beginning and the first one from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy and when we hear head we often think person in charge. And we even have words like it, headmaster, head chef, or whatever. Head chef? I'm a, I, I think my spaghettios. What do I know about being a chef? So, uh, but Paul means here among the possibilities before us, um, what are the possibilities before us? Well, it could be connected in the biological sense. I don't know if you ever thought about this could be authority over or it could be simply prominent we say the head of a column and we mean the capital the top but we don't say that's in charge of the rest of the column and we don't say the capital of the column uh is is significant for the for the life blood of the column to be working so right there we have head can mean in charge, head can be prominent, head can be uh, something about organic connectedness. Now the role of this passage in Paul's thought is that as God's agent, Christ is the one through whom all powers will one day acknowledge the lordship of God. It's his connection with the body that will make that happen. So it isn't necessarily all about his being in charge. You follow me here? But you can see there's a little more complexity than we sometimes imagine. I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is man. This is 1 Corinthians 11, 3. And the head of Christ is God. So a critical issue here is the Greek term kephale, rightly translated head. And the word figures prominently in two other New Testament passages, one we just seen, Colossians 1.18, and also Ephesians 5.23. Now, kephale and its variants are used in Greek literature in anatomical references, such as the head of a lion, but also in Greek literature in geographical references, such as the head of a river. So the LXX, that is the symbol for the Septuagint. So the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. By the time you get to around 200 BC, something like 80% of worldwide Jewish population is living outside of what we today call Israel. So you may remember that after, you know, after they were taken to captivity in Babylon and then the Babylonians lost out to you know, other peoples and then 
and then some of them were 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 resettled under a guy uh, under a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. Some oh, hundreds of thousands of Jews were moved from Syria into what is today Turkey. That's why when when the, when Paul's writing the New Testament, there's Jewish communities and Jewish synagogues in t in what is present day Turkey, but also. There are millions of Jews living all along the, the northern coast of Africa, all the way to Morocco. And these folks lost the ability to read Hebrew. And so it was necessary to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek so they could read their own scriptures. That's called the Septuagint from 70. And that's because there was, according to the story, there were 70 or 72 Jewish scholars who did the, trans, the translating. And the symbol for the Septuagint is LXX. So if you ever see capital L, capital X, capital X, that's the Septuagint. Once again, that is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, largely what we call the Old Testament. Done 200 years before Paul. So when the Septuagint encountered, the, the, the people who translated the Bible from Hebrew into Greek encountered the word rosh in the Hebrew text, which is the word for a head. They generally used kephale when anatomical references are in view. But almost never when authority is in view. That, typically, they chose the word archon which is a Greek word that comes from the lexicon of Athenian, democ uh, Athenian democracy, meaning a, a, a ruler. So uh, bottom line, the Septuagint, if they want to use, if they want to talk about head as authority, they don't choose the Greek word kephale. They choose a different one. And it's rather clear that Paul knows the Septuagint well. Is this trickling? So, I mean, the, the bottom line is just because he uses kephale, we shouldn't, we, we, we cannot simply assume he means authority like top down. Because the Septuagint doesn't do it that way. And he quotes the Septuagint at times. So we know he knows it. And the translated the Septuagint, of course, they're Hebrew speakers and they're trying to. Uh, translate the Hebrew text into Greek, but for a Jewish audience. So it, it is a little difficult to know how to compare the Septuagint to the rest of the corpus of Greek letter, literature from antiquity. But in, but in all, there are only 16 examples of the Septuagint using kephale to translate rosh when authority is in view. So 16 is, that's more than zero but it is, a, it is a wildly small percentage. So big picture, when Paul says headship, there's reason to say, hmm, does he mean authority? Or does he mean the way the head is a part of a body and integrated with the, with the whole? You, follow, you following me there? This can, this can you get a headache after a little while. <laughs> One of those examples is Deuteronomy 28, 13. And the Lord will make you the head and not, not the, the tail. tail. Well, that's really where, where yeah, you're going to be in charge. So, it, the old, so the Septuagint can do that. It just, it does, it does it rarely. That's my point. Mm. Yeah, so 16 is not insignificant, but it is clearly the minority. Now, the Septuagint can also use kephale in the sense of prominent, the capstone of a building. Psalm 117.22, or the top of a mountain, Genesis 8.5. And it's pretty clear that the Septuagint isn't trying to say 
that the top is in charge of the rest of the building or the mountain top is in charge of the rest of the mountain. So once again, kephale in the Septuagint, which is, which is critically important for us in the New Testament, often, most often, does not mean authority. And pretty much when people read in their English New Testaments, someone is the head, don't we pretty much say in charge? Yep. So uh, what I'm saying is we better off saying could be, but let's think about it. <laughs> what is the author really trying to say? So the Colossians passage is, is really pretty interesting because as you, if you just read what's up there, yeah, so capital can mean authority, in charge, but it can also mean organic connectedness. So what, what is in Paul's mind when he writes this in Colossians 2.19? Does that, does it seem to you like that's more about authority or more about what binds us together? It, it sure looks like it's at least what binds us together. It might also be about authority, but it's clearly about what binds us together. Doesn't that put, that just puts a whole different spin, a whole different nuance to how we even understand, doesn't it? Understand headship. So Christ is the Lord of the church and the head of the church. The question is, what meaning do these texts intend to convey by head? And what is the character of lordship? Perhaps the most important issue to know concerning 1 Corinthians 11.3 is that relationships are in view. How is Christ the head of man? How is God the head of Christ? You know, does God the Father say to Christ, you know, go scoop the horse poop, you know, in the corral. <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no bossing around. I mean, they have a common purpose, and they're organically connected in the pursuit of that common purpose. So how is man the head of woman? If the relationship between God and Christ is the model, then our reflection ought to take in view the nature of the relationship between the persons of the Trinity. So I think we've talked about I don't know if I need to re uh, remind us about sense and referent and denotation and connotation. Talked about that at the beginning. Is that, is that clear? Okay. You guys, you want to? You, you, are there any questions you want to ask me at this point? Because I'm doing a lot of talking. So basically, what you're saying is, when it talks about that, what I'm, it's more man and woman's interconnected relationship as opposed to man, quote unquote, being the head or the boss yeah. or the- I'm saying head, and a lot of these, mm -hmm. these uh, related words, those lexically are about more than just who's in charge. They are often about organic connectedness. And that once we put other pieces into this puzzle on it, like how are Christ, how is Christ and God the Father, what's their relationship? They have a, they're united in the love relationship for a common purpose. So it's at least, it seems that if we, it's at least always about, I'm gonna say, organic connectedness. It might be about authority. It can be that about that also. Because Christ and God are equals, right? They yes are, or no? Equals a tough word, because the equal can mean exactly the same. They're not exactly the okay. same. Harmony is very, harmony gets at it. But what they're united in, they're three persons, but they have a common purpose. And we don't, we cannot, we have never experienced that. Hmm. I sometimes have two purposes or more in me, let alone, you know, with my wife. But, um, but what, so what we can kind of imagine, what would it be like 
if with our spouse or with someone else, we had this totally common purpose. Mm -hmm. You may have had even a, a, even a, a time, a, 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 a day or a week or something where you're working on a project with someone and you just, you just knew what the other person was thinking and doing. But that was fleeting. What would it be like if that was all the, the time? time? That's, so that is what, at least in the idea of marriage, that we're supposed to be growing to. It's, so it's, not, it, it's principally about that, not so much about, I, I think, I'm, the way I'm reading the text, not so much about, about proper roles and, who's in a, and who is in authority. What do we even mean by authority? Who's boss? Yeah. Yeah. It is, and that, but then, then Ephesians five is its own set of problems because it is a, what's called a household code. We'll get to that, um, Puni. That's well, Christ too, is the head of the church. It was like five or six slides back. No, back. 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 I remember this about Poonie. No, no, I think it's forward. I think you just, no. I think you just you skipped it. Poonie and I knew each other 30 years ago. Or... So it's more than five, apparently. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, the head of every man is Christ. But what does that mean? That's the point. Is it is it the authority principally who's in charge, or is it how, or is it this organic connectedness? I'm going to say there it's probably both of them in terms of Christ. But in terms of but but the but the basic but the basic meaning here is that is that we are one. We don't just you know Christ calls us friends, right? I mean the, so. So in John's Gospel, seventh chapter, uh, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. In, uh, on the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up in the midst of the temple and cried in a loud voice, uh, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. For as the scriptures say, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Close quote. Then John the Gospel writer says, this he said about the spirit, which had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So big picture, like giant, if we only had three slides to describe reality, slide number one would be creation and something that happens with the fall, and we now live subhuman Sub. existence. Mm -hmm. You and I live less than God intended. What God intended is what Adam and Eve had originally. Sin broke that. We live subhuman. That's why Paul calls Christ the second Adam. He's, his life on earth is what Adam had and lost. So he condescended to live the life that we now are trying to rise up to live into, right? But what, what has happened is the spirit of the living God in the Old Testament falls on people occasionally and then leaves. So Ezekiel 36, God says to his people, I'm going to have to hallow my own name. You know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You ever thought about what that means? I mean, you've said that. How many times have you said that prayer? Hundreds of times? Thousands of times? Our Father art in heaven, go do that hallow thing, whatever that is. You know, don't know what that is, but you go do that. Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be your name. To hallow is, to, is to properly to understand. So Jesus' prayer, our Father, we're in a hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how can, how can, how can the God's will be done on earth the same way as it is in heaven? 
Well, Ezekiel 20, 36, God says, God says to his people, I'm going to have to hallow my own name. Because the people around you are looking at you to learn about me, and they're drawing conclusions about me from looking at you, and those conclusions are wrong, but it ain't their fault. It's your fault, because you're my people, but you're not living according to my principles. So I'm going to have to take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, and I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you. See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit comes on people and then leaves. But what happens in, in Acts 2? Spirit comes and indwells people. That's what Jesus says. And the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up in the midst of the temple and cried in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. For as the scriptures say, out of his belly will flow rivers, of, out of his gut will flow rivers of living water. This he said about the Spirit. So the crucifixion and resurrection makes it possible for the Spirit to come and live in believers. And that's why we can now start living less shaped by the world and more shaped by God and the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. So, so that's, what, that's what Paul is actually referencing and we're living into that. So that's that history of the world in three, panel, <laughs> three panels. So, yes. I said some people argue that. Yeah. I think that's not in the text. Adam. Yeah. They're both equally Adam. Yeah, I mean, there are, it's not really one that the ancient rabbis came up with. It's one that, but that a lot of contemporary Christians uh, put forward um, that, that, that somehow, the, somehow the original sin is Eve usurping Adam's authority. Uh, well, number one, I don't see it in the text. And number two, I don't see Adam's authority, the, the man's authority over woman in the text. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, where, do you, where are you getting that? So yeah, a relevant question in, in, is, uh, oh, I went the wrong one. Yeah, this is, this is also pretty interesting. In Greek literature outside the New Testament, which is most of Greek literature, kephale, meaning authority, is almost non-existent. I mean, that, that's not unrelevant or irrelevant. <laughs> it does before 380. Now, kephale, uh, intending uh, some sort of authority for persons, it can and does mean the main point, however. So the noun kephaleon can be used as a metaphor for authority. It means the primary or main point. But it is not, as far as I know, it's never used to refer to persons as the head or chief or leader or authority until the 300s AD, long after the New Testament was written. One is a human. Okay, I gotta go back here. Yeah, one is a humorous reference to the odd shape of the, of the head of Pericles. You probably, maybe you've heard of Pericles, um, the, the height of Athenian power. Uh, and he was known as having a very odd shaped head, uh, a head, like head shaped like a squill, like, um, like the body of a squid. So really tall and so yeah, but a bizarre shaped head. So, um, so that's one reference of, uh, of the term. And the other is found in the, in the work of the comic poet Menander in his play, uh, The Pericae Romanae. 
But here, the idea is that the arrival of a certain Sosius is the chief point. Not that Sosius is the head as one with authority. So here it's chief point and prominent, not to refer to someone who's in charge. So I don't think that's irrelevant, that in all of Greek literature, contemporary with the New Testament, you don't find that word meaning authority. And if Paul is writing to convey authority and he's writing to a mixed audience, many of whom don't know anything about Judaism, they're, they're Gentile converts, using kephale for authority, well, they, they, would not, they would not draw that conclusion. Plato in his Timaeus could possibly mean authority uh, as in the sense of a ruler or when he says, of, of ruler over when, he's, when he writes of the head of the body, but he can also speak of the soul, suke, in that fashion. And generally for Plato, the soul is in charge of the person, not the head, not the brain. So if Paul fills the word kephalion with the nuance of personal authority, he's the first person we know of in Greek literature to do, the, to do so. That's astonishing. That, that's just, that's, that's a hard one to get around. That, am I making sense here? Apart from the Septuagint, but in just Greek literature generally, he'd be the first one. Now, Paul is writing for an audience from the Old Testament is largely unknown, if it's a Greek audience, as opposed to the translators of the, of the Septuagint who were thinking of a Jewish and not a Gentile audience. All this seems to be, point to me in the direction that Paul did not at least not primarily, intend kephale to be understood as intending authority. Is that making sense here? Now, we're, we're getting pretty far down in the weeds of one piece of the argument, but it's an important one. What does he mean by head? And I'm going to say the bulk of the evidence su suggests that Paul means something besides authority when he talks about headship. He might here and there, but there are clearly passages where he's not talking about authority, like who's in charge, who's the boss, do what I say. It's not that. It's, more, it's much more often this organic connectedness. Is that, any questions about that? Is that making... Um, it, it, it's, it, it's not, it, I wouldn't say it's what it means, but it is, it is connected to that same image. So when Jesus says, I'm the vine, you know, you are the branches, what, you know, there is a place, if you can picture a, a, if you've never been to a vineyard, you can at least have seen commercials of, of wine grapes. And it, there's a place where the, the, the vine and the branch where you can't tell. Where is it the vine and where is it the, where is it the branch? And there's an organic connectedness. Something is flowing, but it's flowing both ways. So what would it be like to be so connected to another person? And that's, that's how Jesus asks, says it can happen. If, you, if the spirit comes and dwells within and you start paying attention and start learning to listen to the spirit, and that also is, what that also is going to do then is it's going to mean that you're also more closely connected to the people around you. So that's not about, it's not about authority, it's about dynamic, organic connection. So Irene, what, uh, how much time do we have? Dave, we have like, 15 minutes, we could do some more Q&A, or you can point us to next week. Or we could do what? Or you could point us to next week. So I think maybe it's better to, it's better to, to leave this next topic for next week, which is what does Paul say about speaking and silence and leadership? Um, because he does say things like, let the women, you know, I, I permit no one to speak. 
uh, et cetera. Um, and then we're gonna get into some, we'll spend some time on, a lot of time on, on the passage in First Timothy, um, uh, when uh, uh, I want men everywhere to pray without rancor and the women, and there's no verb there actually, the women dressing modestly. Um, and then it says, I permit no woman to teach or to bear authority. Now that's a pretty, that's, uh, that's, that's a very complex bit of grammar that we're, that we're gonna have to work through. Um, but I think maybe we should stop here. But uh, any other last, we have 10 minutes left maybe? Qu Keith, any other Keith questions? Keith has one right there. Yes. the new testament and you see uh <laughs> thank you and you see in like first corinthians and it says we have the same mind and the same purpose from a like a holistic standpoint doesn't it seem like paul and the other new testament writers including jesus are trying to get you know even in john 17 he says uh be one as I and my father are one that he's yeah. trying to get at yeah. this heart of connectedness amongst yeah. his followers. I think you, you've hit on, a, on an important mm -hmm. point is that that is a theme that runs through right. and that the, the connectedness that God wanted with us walking in the right. garden, right. Mm -hmm. that that's been lost and, right. he's, and it's trying to reestablish it. Right. Yeah. And so um, the question then is because we're in the in-between, you know, we, we are set free so it's the image really of, of uh, you know, of, of you're in a jail cell and the door has been sprung open. Um, some people walk out and then they walk back in. I mean, think of, think of uh, the Shawshank Redemption, right? The great speech that Red gives at the end. These walls are funny. You know, first you hate them, then you get used to them, and then you need them. We allow ourselves to get to get trapped, and sometimes we really don't want to escape, or we don't have the capacity. We may want to, but we need, and that's where we need other people to help us actually get past those things that are holding us back. So one real question is: is the dominant idea in buying all these passages, what is the right order, or is the dominant idea where are we going? What's the direction? And what are we, what, to what are we aiming at? <laughs> it's a bad sentence. That, that's how it seems to me. So we're gonna see here, speaking in silence. So part of it is, I'll just give you a quick, quick view. Um, uh, where Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 that the women should be silent. That's a word for, yeah, be, be quiet because they're disturbing what's going on. There's another word for women should learn in quietness. That doesn't mean don't say anything. It means be receptive, right? I mean, if you're a teacher, you know that sometimes students arrive and they're not really interested in learning. You can't force them to. You've got to, you've got to be willing to learn. So, so quietness, silence doesn't mean, doesn't necessarily mean shut up when those words appear. So. I think just to honor everyone's time, I think that's a great way for us to go. Tonight, a lot of what we unpacked is looking at language, right? And I, I speak two languages. So even for me looking at, you know, if I were to say one word for you in Russian, there's 20 ways to say the word love and conjugated in Russian, depending on my relationship to you and my collective stance of our collective society. Russian is a collective society, not fully communal, but collective. In American is individualistic. We have different associations of words that we use. So even that, in my own personal experience, I have to apply that now to how Dave just walked us through all the translations from Hebrew, Greek, and then a translation to when the Jewish people that were, I mean, I'm misquoting, when they were, how many years removed from knowing their own Hebrew and the Greek? Oh, a couple hundred. So, yeah. yeah. So all of this could be really important until we even get to the English translation, which is why we even talk about 
what kind of interpretation to use for your Bible. So a lot of next week and the couple of weeks we'll unpack is looking at, you know, in Galatians 3, 28, it says neither G, neither Greek or Jew, male or female. And we kind of have separated one part to create certain structures within which we start translating scripture, right? And so we're going to keep unpacking that a little bit because what I want us to look focus at is if Christ came and his death on the cross meant something for us and gave us full victory, what have we created as humans and part of our translation and knowing history and the context, where are we limiting one another from living the full gifting and call that God has on either one on all of us? Does that, does that make sense, y'all? Like that's what we're going to keep unpacking. So a lot of tonight was just looking at history and language and the value that we have and how words have been translated. And I just want to go back to Genesis, like finding out for myself what Azer meant, that as a helpmate is also, that word is used to describe God as a mighty savior. That's pretty powerful. That changes even the first that like building block of my view of scripture. So I'm hoping that as you take this away, just keep inviting God to speak in your life, the Holy Spirit that indwells in you to show you where really, how do I see the freedom in Christ that we all have? And what does the new gospel, what does the New Testament do that way? We just celebrated on Sunday. Dave, do you want to add anything to that as I try to? That was great. Okay. That was great. So, <laughs> let's give Dave a round of applause. That was excellent.